Hi, this is Anita from the Dusty Roads podcast. If any of you have been listening to my podcast, you will know that one of the things that I enjoy quite a bit is history. So today I want to go back a little bit into history because I feel like there's so much that we can learn about the world. And if we're going to truly live our lives as a global citizen, which is our our tagline for this podcast and for our blog, A Bus on a Dusty Road, it's so important to understand a little bit about the history. And this is especially important if you plan to travel or see some of the world. You will gain so much more in your travel and experience if you can understand a bit more about the history of where you're going. Today, I want to kind of answer the question and talk a little bit about what happened to the Hmong after the Vietnam War. And when I talk about the Hmong, there are Hmong in China, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, which is formerly Burma, and also Laos. I'm going to be talking mostly about the Hmong that were in Laos. And the reason is, is because the Hmong and Lao were the ones that were most highly affected by the Vietnam War. It was not like the Vietnam Hmong were not affected, but they were very much on the side of the Vietnamese or the Viet Minh. But it was really the Hmong that were in Lao that were affected during the Vietnam War. And the reason is, is that the Americans recruited the Hmong to help to fight with them among the American soldiers. There were literally thousands of them that were fighting and working in Laos. I have a friend whose family is Hmong, and his father worked for the Americans during the war. In his father's village, the Americans had set up a radar, and so he worked on the radar there. And he spoke about when the war ended, his family had to leave Laos. And so they spent months traveling through the jungles at night to avoid being caught or avoid being seen. And his mother would give him opium as a baby so that he wouldn't cry. And he said by the time he arrived to Thailand, to the refugee camp, he was addicted on opium. You know, this shows a bit that when the war ended and the Vietnam War ended, that the Hmong in Laos were in a terrible position. The Hmong fighters now became the enemies of the present Laotian government and were considered persona non gratis. You know, some were put into forced labor camps or kicked out of their home and land. And so for most of them, it wasn't like they really had so much of a choice. They suddenly had no land. They had no home. They had no way to eat, no way to survive. They needed to find a way to survive. And that is why they came over to many countries and especially the United States. So when we speak about the Hmong that are suffering during the Vietnam War, we really need to talk about the Laotian Hmong. You know, because the Hmong that were in China, Thailand, Myanmar, you know, we're not as highly affected as the Laotian Hmong. The Laotian Hmong were in a terrible state when the war ended. The North Vietnam bombed their villages and the new Laotian government saw the Hmong as enemies of the state. So they essentially became refugees in their own country. The war destroyed their livestock and their lands. The U.S., you know, for a while sponsored some food drops. So they started to send rice and other food drops into Laos so the people could survive. But this really was not a long-term solution for anyone. So in February 1973, after the Vientiane Agreement was signed, which called for a ceasefire in Laos and a coalition government, this also ended the U.S. air support. So at the time, the American relief programs also ceased, and the new Laotian regime considered the Hmong as enemies of the state. So about 1,000 to 3,000 of the Hmong, mainly the high-ranking army officers, the U.S. helped airlift and to bring their families to Thailand. But thousands more who had fought from Americans or <clears throat> had remained neutral were left behind with a ravaged country that was controlled by the North Vietnamese. The Hmong were also forced to relocate to the lowland areas and were forced to work in state-owned collective farms. 
They also were forced into what was called seminar camps. So they were forced to be you know, re-educated through the new regime or the new government. So essentially, you can imagine that they really lost their life and they lost their complete livelihood. They lost their homes. They lost their way of life. They lost their livestock. They literally lost everything. So the only thing that they could really do would be to make the hazardous journey to Thailand on foot, which means they'd be hiding in the jungles, walking mainly at night, and then trying to cross the Mekong River to go into that bordered between Laos and Thailand and to get into Thailand. Many of them along the way died of disease, starvation, exposure, and even drowning during this journey to Thailand. I have a very good friend who is not Hmong, but she is Laotian. And her father was in the army in Laos. And she told me once about her family's experience where her father was placed in a prison camp or one of the re-education camps. And because her mother was a nurse, they had said that if her mother would come and work at the camp, and bring the family there with them, with them, that they would eventually let the father go. So for two years, she lived at the camp with her father, and her mother worked there as a nurse. But in the process, her older brother died of malaria. You know, so it's kind of like, you know, if the diseases didn't get you, if the starvation didn't get you, if the bombs didn't get you, you know, something was going to get you. So many of the Hmong and even the Laotians that worked for the former government were essentially, you know, it was very difficult for them to survive. So they were essentially just fighting every single day for their lives. It was a very dangerous crossing to go across the Mekong River. It was not easy. You know, and once they got to the refugee camps, you know, um, that it was basically it was a makeshift camp. There was no electricity, no running water. There was no real sewage disposal. And it was significantly overcrowded. The conditions of the camp were actually not very easy. So you can imagine, here's a group of people that fought for the Americans during the war, who have been forced out of their own countries, and who now must cross over into Thailand and into these refugee camps, which are basically don't have any type of sanitation or other systems. And it's an overcrowded and a very difficult camp. And they need to wait and hope that they can somehow get to a country that will be willing to take them in as a refugee. You know, because many of the Hmong had the military ties, they uh, many of them wanted to migrate to the United States. But the Hmong and the Laotians or the higher education were allowed to leave for the United States first with others waiting behind. So many of the others had to wait for years in these camps to be able to get replaced to another country or to the United States. Over the years, the U.S. government has allowed 200,000 Hmong to come to the United States, and many of them now reside in the states of Minnesota, California, and Wisconsin. Now, I grew up in Wisconsin. And I can tell you that Wisconsin is cold. And many of these Hmong live in the northern part of Wisconsin, which is colder than Milwaukee, where I live. I sometimes wonder what the shock must have been to come from Southeast Asia, where, yes, it can get cold, and it can get cold up in the mountains where they were, but it doesn't get like 40 below cold like we can get here. It must have been a huge shock to them to suddenly be in such a cold environment with snow and the cold winters like we have here. And that just shows that even though the Hmong were able to come to America, the adjustment in America was not very easy. I now have been into, I have been into quite a few Hmong villages in Vietnam. We do charity work with a group called Project Sprouts. And with Project Sprouts, we go into a lot of the villages in Northern Vietnam and we help to give winter coats and and boots and school supplies to the children. Many of these schools and many of these places we go are Hmong. 
And I can tell you, having been to many of these places, that even today, many of the Hmong live a very simple life. Our farmers who work up in the mountains, who do terrace farming, they live in a simple house. They grow their crops. Many of them don't have a very high education. In fact, this is one of the problems is that many of the Hmong may leave school early because their family doesn't have money for them to be able to continue school or they might need them at home. Or in the case of many of the young girls, they might need the um, oldest daughter to help take care of some of the younger children while the parents work out into the fields. So among many of the Hmong, even in Vietnam, many of them can be lacking some basic education, even a high school education. And very few of them actually go on to, to get a college degree. So you can imagine, you know, the, the Hmong coming from Laos, from similar situations where they were terrorist farmers, they lived a, a very simple life, suddenly coming to the fast-paced America. And many of them too, maybe they were important in their home village and suddenly they come to America and they're picking strawberries or they're doing something else like that, some work that they never thought that they would be doing. It was difficult for them. You know, so when you talk about the Hmong and you talk about the Vietnam War, you really need to talk about Lao because they are the ones that were really highly affected by this. In 1963, of the 300,000 Hmong living in Lao, more than 19,000 men were eventually recruited by the CIA to work for the United States government during the war. The CIA recruited the men into a guerrilla unit, or what's called the SGU, and that the other Laotians were enlisted in what could be the armed forces. Each soldier was paid an equivalent of $3 a month. And they were basically fighters. They were actually fighting for the American forces during the war. Um, you know, America also did help to drop some food for them and also help to uh, build some schools. But the main goal for the group of the Hmong soldiers was basically for them to guide the U.S. bombing missions, to rescue the downed U.S. pilots, and to block the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So... It wasn't like the Hmong were just sitting in their villages and, you know, kind of working for the Americans. They were actually out there actively fighting as soldiers during the war and losing their lives alongside the Americans during the Vietnam War. As I mentioned before, some of them set up a radar system to help track the U.S. planes that were flying into North Vietnam and to be able to man these radars. I really feel like these Hmong fighters deserve the respect of the Americans. And they're also often many times forgotten during the war for their sacrifice that they made. Because many of them made the ultimate sacrifice was that they gave up their home, their lives, their families, their relatives, their culture, their food, they gave up so many things to fight for the Americans during the Vietnam War. I'm sure when they first signed up to fight for the Americans, they didn't think about this ultimate price that they would pay, that many of them would pay with their own lives. And those that did not pay with their own lives, they certainly paid by losing their culture and losing many times their livelihood and losing their families. You know, many of them left behind their parents, their grandparents, their uncles, their aunts, their other relatives, and not sure whether or not they would ever be able to see them again. I don't think that we can ever really repay the sacrifice that these Hmong, Laotian Hmong made to be able to help the Americans during the Vietnam War. For them, we should be thankful for them and for their sacrifice. So when you ask yourself, you know, what happened to the Hmong? Why are the Hmong in America? They're not here because of choice. They are here because they were basically forced out of their own country. I don't think anybody wants to really be forced out of their own country. I don't think anybody wants to be forced off their land. I don't think anybody wants to become persona nagratis in their own country. 
I don't think there's anyone that would say that is something that I want to do or something that I want to have happen to me in my life. I imagine there must be many Hmong that are in America that maybe feel sad because maybe they feel like their children don't really understand the Hmong culture. Maybe they feel that their children or their grandchildren are so American and yet they may feel that they are so Hmong. I don't think that we can ever quite understand that and what they are going through, but they certainly deserve our respect for all they did during the war. And the truth is that the CIA and many of the American leadership kept the secret throughout the entire war. So even though they were fighting and dying alongside the American soldiers, there were many Americans that were not aware of their sacrifice and all that they were doing to help America. For that and for their sacrifice, we certainly do owe them a great deal of respect. Well, this is Anita from the Dusty Roads podcast, and I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast and have enjoyed learning a little bit about the history of the Hmong, particularly during the Vietnam War. I believe it's important to understand, especially if you're going to travel to Thailand or, or Vietnam or China, where you may see some of the Hmong people, is to understand that not all the Hmong are the same, that not all of the Hmong were the ones that fought for the Americans. In fact, it was really mainly the Hmong in Lao that did. And of course, there might have been some Hmong in Vietnam, but it was mainly the Hmong in Lao who fought for the Americans during the Vietnam War. And it's important to understand that how much the war affected these countries, the culture, and these people, and that the devastation that a war can have. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope that as you go about your life, that you will live your life as a global citizen, and that you will want to learn about other places and other people and their lives. And as you do that, it will not only enrich your life, but it will help you to understand the world. Thank you so much. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider to subscribe and to let others know about our podcast. We'd love to hear from you or hear any suggestions that you may have. Thank you so much for listening because we realize without you listening, this podcast would not be possible.